This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. Most of us know how to recycle, but are we doing it the right way and could we improve? Coming up, ways to save your tax dollars. A local manufacturing institute helps to fuel the talent pipeline. I'll have that story coming up. Plus, it's a sport where players slide stones on ice. In tonight's One Tank Trip, grab a coat. We're taking you curling. Don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. According to the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, recycling sustains 15,000 jobs statewide and helps the environment by reducing what gets sent to the limited space in our landfills. As Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark explains, not recycling and not recycling the right way could cost you more money. One by one, trucks back into the Metrolina Recycling Center in North Charlotte. Mecklenburg County owns the facility and ReCommunity Recycling operates it. A front end loader scoops everything into a hopper, which sends bottles, cans, and paper onto a fast moving conveyor belt. In the pre sort area, Michael Kilgo and dozens of sorters constantly scan, grab, and remove items like plastic film that could clog up machinery. Kilgo can't believe what homeowners toss into their recycling bins. I don't think they actually realize that most of the stuff is being recycled. They use their recycling bin as sort of a trash can. If something like a metal car part or lawnmower blade slips by unnoticed, plant manager Tim Owen says it could shut down the operation for hours. It causes uh, a lot of damage to our machinery when it comes through. It gets caught on in shafts and the components that are moving. It just locks them up tight and a lot of times it will break them or damage them. So we have to replace them and uh, this causes a lot of downtime issues. Not to mention, put workers at risk. The Metrolina Recycling Center processes more than 400 tons of recyclable materials daily, most of which comes from Charlotte, as well as the six towns throughout Mecklenburg County. And the municipalities in Mecklenburg County actually collect the materials and we process the materials. We actually take them and we bind them together and we find markets or places for those materials to go. The recyclables pass through a series of rotating magnets, optical sorters, and chutes where paper, plastic, glass, and aluminum items are sorted, compacted, and baled before being sold to recycling markets worldwide. Dave Lank is a director of operations for ReCommunity Recycling. You name it, and he's seen it. Every ton of material that gets recycled is a ton that doesn't have to be buried in a landfill somewhere. Every time we recycle a piece of paper or a plastic bottle or an aluminum can, we save energy, we save natural resources, and we actually save the community, ultimately you, money. On nearly any day of the week, you'll see recycling bins lining the neighborhood streets across Mecklenburg County. Those green containers may lead you to think that nearly everyone is recycling, but that's not simply the case. Between 40 to 50% of Mecklenburg County residents do not recycle. I think about 150,000 to 200,000 tons of materials that are currently going into landfills could actually come here. Charlotte homeowner Calvin Kinley says recycling has become a habit. It's just one more thing you do. McKinley says it's troubling to hear that so many others aren't even bothering to recycle. Landfill space is going to be getting real short 20, 30 years from now. Where are they going to put it? Back at the recycling center, about 12% of what ends up here isn't recyclable and has to be taken to the landfill. So I decided to have Dave Lank look at my recycling bin. A wire hanger. That's not in the program. We can't take that material. And that can get clogged and caught in the machine as well. The second item was this notebook I thought could be recycled. Dave suggested putting that in my household garbage, along with the third item, this paper cup. Unfortunately, coffee cups are not recyclable. Really? Why? Because and that's a, that's a kind of an odd thing that a lot of people don't know. There's a layer 
of plastic in the middle that you can't see. So the people that recycle paper that we sell to can't use this. So they don't want to see coffee, paper coffee cups. So Starbucks cups, that kind of thing, are actually not recyclable. He also found a plastic grocery bag and a section of a rubber hose. That's a no-no, both of those. For every 100 tons of recyclables processed here, about 12 tons of non-recyclables are taken to the landfill near Charlotte Motor Speedway. Last year, Mecklenburg County Solid Waste paid more than a half million dollars in landfill and transportation fees. We owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our children, because sooner or later, no matter how big a landfill is, it's going to fill up. And then there's going to be the question, where do we go next? Once the landfill in Cabarrus County is full, Mecklenburg County may have to transport its garbage and all those items we're not recycling even farther away at a much greater cost to taxpayers. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. Check the recycling program in your area because what's recyclable depends on which facility processes your recyclables. For more recycling tips, visit our website at pbscharlotte.org. When local manufacturers struggled to find skilled workers, leaders from Rowan and Cabarrus counties came together to find a solution, forming the North Carolina Manufacturing Institute. The program helps companies improve productivity and profitability by building a talent supply chain. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser introduces us to some recent grads. Taking center stage on the factory floor, 24-year-old Stephanie Proctor tightens bolts, turning over a new leaf with a career in manufacturing at Agility Fuel Systems. Here at Agility, Stephanie works as an assembler, building natural gas fuel systems. This is a side mount system. The system allows semis like these to run on compressed natural gas, an alternative to diesel. There's not really ever any downtime, 24-7. You're constantly doing something, and it's not just mindless work. That's the other thing. You've got to think about how something fits into something. You've got to be able to read blueprints, know how things go together. It's challenging. It's intellectually challenging. This is Stephanie's first manufacturing job, and she's already hooked. It's awesome. I love it here. You say 505 thousandths minus two tenths. She graduated from the North Carolina Manufacturing Institute last November. Leaders from several organizations, including Rowan and Cabarrus Chambers of Commerce, the Central Line Workforce Development Board, and Rowan Cabarrus Community College came together to form the eight-week program, working to close the gap between job seekers and job openings. This course is designed to get their foot in the door, get their appetites wet, for working in manufacturing and learning and advancing on their own. At the end of the course, students take a national assessment to become a certified production technician, qualifying them for 90% of manufacturing jobs in our area. You're helping people find jobs, and that makes you feel good. I want you to convert these to inches. Instructor Stan Honeycutt brings more than 30 years of industry experience to the classroom and the ability to teach students things they can't learn from a textbook. We talk about being on time, showing up a few minutes before the class starts to replicate what it would be like working in manufacturing, show up before the shift starts. I never expected to be able to come into the class and learn so much in such a little bit of time. Michael McDonald balances coursework with a full-time job. He works seven days a week to support his family. And with four boys at home, he has a lot of mouths to feed. Grocery store all the time. At 35, Michael says he decided to go back to school for a shot at steady employment. Stability and, you know, to be able to take care of my, my family. The inaugural class graduated from the North Carolina Manufacturing Institute in August. Just two months later, Agility opened its doors at this Salisbury plant. The company has already hired nine graduates from the program. Two days. Two days after I graduated from the program, I was hired on with Agility. The folks that we've got out of the CPT class have been uh, very high level, very hands on, and seem to support and learn very fast. They're all learning together, they're all helping each other out, they're all working as a team, and they're all encouraging each other to improve themselves, which improves the company. 
Deshaun Mills suits up for his shift in the paint department. You go in there, you got to make sure you go in there, put the suit on. He often volunteers to work on weekends, eager to get more experience. Learn. The more I learn, the better I'll be. He's jumped in. Uh, he's He wants to learn everything from the inside out. At Agility, entry-level jobs pay about $35,000 a year, with room for raises based on performance and training. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, manufacturing jobs are among the fastest growing in the nation. In January, manufacturers added 29,000 jobs with an average annual salary close to $70,000. It's been going great for me, 22 years old. I've talked to all my friends about it. I've talked to people here about the class. Stephanie Proctor says the program provided her with more than a job. It gave her a second chance, reigniting her passion for learning. She plans to go back to school to earn a degree in industrial engineering. My parents raised me to believe that education is extremely important, and they always told me um, no one can take that away from me. Day in, day out, Stephanie and Deshaun take pride in the work they do for a living, grateful for a fresh start and a career that offers stability and room to grow. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. Scholarships cover the majority of the cost for the course, and students pay about $40 to enroll. So far, 27 people have graduated. All but three have found full-time work. Robert Van Guion's executive director of Rowan Works joins me now with more. Robert, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. You know, what an exciting program. Talk to us a little bit. We often have thought that manufacturing is dead. But it's not. It's just a different form of manufacturing. It requires a different education. Well, I think uh, as you look today, uh, the growth in technology in, in all of our workplaces uh, has led to a different manufacturing floor, a different medical office floor, a uh, different banking floor. And so uh, today's workers, regardless of industry, need to be able to understand the workplace, the demands that go with it, and an understanding of the technologies that have to be applied. And that's where we've seen a shift, especially in manufacturing, as we become more advanced and integrated with technology. Talk to us about why there's a need for the North Carolina Manufacturing Institute. Coming out of the recession, Rowan County employers created thousands of jobs in our community. And I think one of the toughest things as an economic developer is to hear an employer say, I can't find the employees I need. Uh, living in the community, I know that there were hundreds of people actively searching for work, uh, but we weren't, as a community, delivering uh, the worker that our employers needed. And that conversation, uh, wanting to ensure that we were improving our workforce, finding people a career and not just a job, uh, helped lead to this. Uh, also looking at what our employers needed in the sense of it could reduce their costs, uh, reduce their time spent. Uh, we don't want people having to churn through 25, 30 applicants to find the right employee. We want them hiring 10 and keeping 9, uh, which is about what we're seeing in the statistics of this program. It's exciting to see that it's not just for students right out of high school, that there's a lot of folks going back to kind of retool their skills and that these are skills that are transferable. Help us understand how that all works. Participants in the program come out with uh, certifications, and some of them apply directly to being a certified production technician. Uh, but many of the other things, reading for information, understanding the workplace needs, safety, uh, all those things are transferable and things that they can take with them. It also helps the candidate or the uh, potential employee build their resume and expand their knowledge base, uh, helping them advance in the future and, and leading them on a path uh, for upward success with the companies. I also think that this is part of a long-standing dialogue in our community and one we're trying uh, to really have across all uh, segments of our population is to be successful today, you have to commit to being a lifelong learner. Uh, the, the way that our economy is evolving and the, and the speed at which things are changing, if you're not continuing to improve your skills, you will eventually be left behind. You talked about advancing through the workforce. We saw in that story, folks can start out around $35,000, but where are the upward opportunities, perhaps if you're able to go on to be a supervisor? Yeah, well, even just with regards to being a production employee, uh, many of these employers, while they start at that rate, uh, as you add skills, or even with a relatively short time, a matter of a year or two, you can see that grow uh, rapidly from 35 to 40 and above. And then as you move up, uh, or even move into other production jobs that may have higher technical skills, you can see pay $65,000, $75,000. Supervisors and uh, those that move into higher level management positions easily earn uh, in a, 
over six figures. So there's great potential uh, for someone. I, and I think that's one of our goals is to improve our workforce's future opportunities as well as their current employment situation. And it is kind of that upward mobility. Many folks who are used to the old style of manufacturing, you just had one job and you stayed in that for 30 years and there wasn't as much upward mobility, but you're seeing a lot more of this uh, just starting somewhere and moving on. Well, and when you look at statistics of uh, all employees across sectors, the odds of going into a uh, taking your first job and lasting their 30 years and taking your retirement uh, are, are slim to none, practically. So you need to be flexible. Uh, you need to be adaptable. And employers want employees that can be cross-trained, uh, that can take on challenges, that can learn in the workplace as they bring in new equipment or new products online. And I think that's what this program provides a, a very firm foundation of. Uh, it helps an employee uh, understand where they're at, where they can be uh, improving their skills, but also gives them some diverse knowledge that will help them in future jobs as well. Robert Van Gians, Executive Director of Rowan Works, thanks so much for sharing your information and this story with us today. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. You know, sometimes the most difficult challenges bring us closer to those we love. Our next story is about a couple who had successful careers, but after moving to Charlotte, they encountered a devastating health problem. As Carolina Impact's Jason Turzis explains, their passion to open an art gallery has given them a renewed sense of hope and courage. A family game of basketball, father and son against mother and daughter, the perfect way to get the competitive juices flowing and hopefully have some fun. But for the Antonio family, a simple game of hoops means a little bit more. Originally from California, William Antonio played college basketball at Chaminade University in Hawaii. His agent suggested he try out for a pro team in the Philippines after graduation. What followed was a successful 15-year pro career. A lot of people don't know that the Philippines is the second uh, longest running to the NBA as far as a professional league. Born in the Philippines but raised in Charlotte, Anna Amigo Antonio returned to her native country to attend college. She then became a sports and lifestyle reporter for a television station. That's where she met William. Growing up, William had another love, painting. But as his basketball career took off, he put his brushes aside. Towards the end of my career, my brother, which would always paint with me when I was little, would say, why don't you pick up the brush again and, and come up with some of your cool ideas and abstract stuff that you did when you were little. So William started painting again, and people in the Philippines noticed. Soon he was commissioned to supply art for an 80-room resort. And with his basketball career winding down and a renewed interest in painting, William had options. Everybody knows a career ends in basketball and all sports. It ends somehow. And I wanted to get into coaching and stuff in the Philippines, and, and I you know, have a lot of ties there still. I still go back. Um, but we were like, you know, with basketball, it's like everything's scheduled around that. My wife had her, her boutiques in the Philippines. Um, but what made us really come together here was um, when my wife got sick. Already dealing with a lifelong blood disorder, Anna was doing some traveling with their kids in the summer of 2013 when her health started deteriorating. And by the time we got to Charlotte, I, I was just feeling really yucky and my stomach started to grow really big and then I couldn't sleep and it was painful. Turns out my liver had shut down completely. When I came back, she was already in the hospital uh, looking pretty, pretty bad. So from there, I just dropped all the basketball and everything was focused on, on Anna and the kids. I had bud chiari. It's a very rare blood clot. It's like one out of a million people get it. And it, um, it puts a clot in one of the veins of the liver. And so there was no flow in and out, and, and it caused my, pretty much my liver to blow up. Anna couldn't get a new liver right away because of too many complications, including kidney failure. After months waiting and stabilizing, she finally received the liver transplant. She spent half the year in the hospital. You see so many people um, just supporting you, sorry. Like supporting you through all, throughout all that and seeing like all the doctors like doing their best and just family everywhere and friends everywhere just sending prayers. The recovery process was long and painful, but thanks to faith, family and friends, Anna pulled through. More than two years later, she's doing much better now, but still goes for weekly blood draws. Yeah, it was a tough time, but I saw all the beauty the world can offer. 
Now back living in Charlotte full time and raising their two children, the Antonios began a new chapter in their family's history. Combining William's love of painting with Anna's love of entertaining, they opened up the gallery last summer in Charlotte's South End. It features coffee, wine, made to order sandwiches, Lady M cakes, which are flown in from New York, and of course, William's art. I enjoy doing abstract stuff. I like to get ideas from what I see, uh, landscape, sunsets, and then just kind of play with the paint. I think this has been very therapeutic. It's helped me heal. With roughly half of all startup businesses failing within the first five years, getting things up and running is a major challenge. But compared to what the Antonio family has endured, they say maintaining the gallery is a snap. All these things, the business, and my art, selling the art, the, you know, the gallery with Anna's situation, we all had to learn how to make it flow and make it work. Otherwise, it's, it'll be really tough. There's nothing that is thrown at me since then that I know I can't handle. Like I guess like in a game situation, you gotta learn how to adjust. And if you don't adjust and you point fingers at everybody, then you lose the game. And in the game of life, it's, it's similar. The Antonio family continues to prove that it can win on the court, in the operating room, and at the game of life. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks so much, Jason. The gallery is open seven days a week and available for evening parties, art showings, and other functions. Well, how much do you know about curling? You might have caught a glimpse of it while watching the Winter Olympics. All I knew about it before watching the story was it looked pretty funny. And if you've ever wondered why do they sweep the ice, you're about to find out. In tonight's One Tank Trip, producer Russ Hunsinger explains more about this sport that actually started in Scotland, but is gaining popularity here in the usually sunny south. Slip sliding away. We drove just over two hours to get here. Slip sliding away. Well, I've seen it on TV a couple times at the Olympics. Sleep, 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 sleep. This is my first time. Way. It doesn't take long at all to pick up the sport. Here it comes, here it comes. Sweep, 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 sweep. It takes years to really develop the finesse with it. How many Canadians in the group? I grew up in, uh, in Brandon, Manitoba on the prairies in Canada and uh, curling. From a curling family, everyone curled. Sweet. I have four children. One, two, three, good job. Awesome. And, and they've never curled before. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to share this with them because I love the sport. Who would like to try first? Today we had to learn to curl. Okay, here it comes. And it is the best opportunity to get started with curling because it gives you an hour and a half on the ice of just experience, basic experience of learning to deliver the rock. Nicely done. Having a chance to sweep. Sweep, 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 sweep. Having a chance to slide down the ice. Slide, leg back, stay down low. Good job, good job, good job. And then being able to see what it looks like and, and the effort it takes to really get a 42 pound rock to get from one end of the sheet to the other. Curling is a sport where you throw rocks, curl them down the ice, and try to score points. Sweep it to the broom, nice. You know, curling is a game of strategy. It is certainly a game of balance. Look at it go, she's down, what is it? Technique, okay. a lot of people call it shuffleboard on ice. Cool. Throw a rock and sweep it until you score, if you can. Basic rules is that there are four players on a team, they take turns, they rotate, either the delivery position or the sweeping position. There's a person at the other end of the house that's calling the shots and giving the strategy. There you go, beautiful. The house is the big bullseye. There could be a lot of different colored rocks in the house, but the closest one to the very center of the button, the very center of the bullseye, is the one that really determines who's scored. Nice release. Very it's a lot harder than it looks. It looks like you just throw the rock down and you'll make it down there, but it takes a lot more effort to get it all the way. The tricky part is just sliding. Okay, sweet, you sweet, gotta make sweet, sure sweet. you got your balance in order and then you just, you're just you just throwing rocks down the sheet of ice and you just gotta figure out how hard you throw them. So when you're sweeping, okay, you're gonna walk sideways. Sweeping makes the rock go faster and straighter. So when the skip gets very excited and they're calling this sweep, sweep, sweep. sweep. Sweet, it's it because up. they found the right line and they want to keep it on that line to make it go to the exact spot where it's supposed to land. Okay. You know the near destination, oh, you slip sliding away. 
I like trying to figure out where the rock is going to end up. There are a couple times I threw the rock and I never expected it to end up there. It's something you have to get used to, something you have to practice a lot, but I'd come back and do it again. I think people know about the sport, they just never considered playing it or didn't maybe know they could. To just be successful with it and have a good time with it, you can do that right out of the gate. Push off with your foot and push! Yay! You never know until you try. It's a wonderful sport and one that you can play from really young to really old. Good game, good game, good game, good game. Thanks so much, Russ. The Charlotte Curling Association has more than 150 members. They offer learning to curl classes Tuesday nights and Saturday afternoons. Events run from September through May. For more details, look for this story on our Carolina Impact page at pbscharlotte.org. Well, before we go, I want to remind you about our third annual STEM Awards ceremony on May 5th. That night, we'll recognize terrific teens and teachers in 6th through 12th grades at CPCC's Pease Auditorium. Head to our website for details and specific about the 13 categories in science, technology, engineering, and math. I know you've got smart kids and grandkids, and we'd love to shine the spotlight on them. The deadline to enter is just three weeks away on March 14th. You'll find all the details on our homepage at pbscharlotte.org. Well, we also want to remind you to friend us on Facebook for a chance to win monthly prizes. You know you can never have enough friends, and we'd love to add you to our list. Well, that does it for all of us this week. Thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.